All right, well, let's go ahead and get started just a few uh, seconds earlier than normal. Yeah. Uh, this is our final week of the webinar Collaborate. And we have been discussing Pentecostal theology and praxis of men and women working together for God's kingdom, for the kingdom of God, for his gospel. And how do we, how do we practice that theology that we as Pentecostals and Charismatics have innately? I wanted to start out with reading scripture because this is what it all seems to hinge on is Acts 2. Uh, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. They all seemed, they all, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then you go on to 17 and 18 where it talks about in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy again. It's reiterated. And then in the end, verses 42 to 47 is the key. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So that is the point. We aren't doing this just uh, for equality's sake, although we believe in the, we believe that all humans are created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. But we are doing this so that the Lord will add the number to his kingdom daily um, for those who are being saved. And so that's our heart and our desire is that this is an issue of bringing people to Jesus. So that's why it's so important. And today I am so excited to have Dr. Comfort Max with, with, with us because I believe that this issue of um, practicing our theology is not just an issue here that we face in America, but it is a global issue. And so how do you navigate those challenges in other contexts? And as a woman of color, how do you navigate those challenges that we have um, trying to work together for God's kingdom, no matter our gender. But I just want to thank you for joining us, and I'd like to open us in prayer. So, Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives, and I thank you for this opportunity that we have to learn from Dr. Comfort Maxworth. I pray that you would bless her. I thank you for the anointing that is on our life. I thank you for her friendship. I just thank you for the, um, the many things that you're doing in her and through her, and I just pray you will take control of this webinar, of this time that we have together, Lord. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So what oh. we're going to be doing today is more like having a conversation. I've got some questions that I'm going to ask her and um, we're going to start out, Dr. Maxworth, if you would mind just sharing a little bit about your calling and your background. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Futo. This is a real blessing and an honor. Um, to be here. I just want to first of all say hi to um, the few people who have joined us and those who watch this recording later. Um, it's a blessing and I'm so happy to be here. I bring you warm greetings from Ghana, all the way from Accra, Ghana. Uh, may God bless you and as you take time to listen. And thank you, Dr. Fulto. You have, you've been a great friend and a colleague and I'm so happy God um, brought you my way. 
along the line at SUM. Yeah, so I'm um, a little bit about myself. As you said, I'm originally from Ghana, West Africa. Um, I've had, I have my Bachelor of Arts um, from the University of Ghana. Um, I did my, I uh, majored in philosophy and the study of religions from the University of Ghana. Then I continued on to um, do my master's degree in the United States um, at um, Florida International University in Miami, Florida. And I changed um, location again, moved all the way to uh, New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, um, to do my PhD also in religious studies. Um, so um, I've just been all over the place. And my research interests are mostly um, generally in um, the intersection between um, religion and politics in Africa. And I've done work on Pentecostalism and politics in Ghana. I've also done something on occult and politics in, in Ghana. So I've, I've been all over uh, the place when it comes to religion and politics. And while I was growing up, I really wanted, I wanted to be three things. I'm a lawyer, I'm a journalist, or a teacher. Um, I thought, uh, why not? I, could, I can do all three. Um, um, but then while I... I, when I finished my, my bachelor's, I had a real opportunity to be a teaching assistant um, in the University of Ghana's um, Religious Studies Department. And that was when I knew my real calling, that I was a natural teacher. Um, so that spurred me on to just um, have my master's degree in, um, in Religious Studies and go on to do my PhD, just to become a, a lecturer. Um, so um, I've done that. <laughs> I've been around, I've taught in the US, I've taught in New Zealand, and now I'm back in Ghana um, as a full academic teaching at Perez University College and also um, lecturing with SUM Theological um, um, Seminary and Bible College. And I, I love the fact that my church, International Charismatic Church, gives me the opportunity to also teach and be a minister, SUM gives me that opportunity to, Perez University gives me that opportunity to, to live out my passion, uh, my calling every day, um, helping to shape their minds and also to nurture people, even as they prepare themselves to become ministers of the gospel. So that is me, um, young a woman um, in my um, mid 30s. I'm not yet married, very soon I will be. I'm excited about it. So. Um, that's me. I've just recently been ordained as a minister of the gospel. And so that's me. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about me, Dr. Fulton. <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations on your engagement. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to speak about that a little bit later. Yeah, we will. I need to fill you in. <laughs> yes. So my next question is what are the challenges that you face as an ordained woman in ministry in your country? Um, for me, I'm, I'm so, um, I, I would first of all say that it's, it's both an honor and a blessing to be counted among one of the few people to serve God's um, um, flock. Um, but then I also feel blessed that my church does not put too many restrictions on women. Uh, when it comes to uh, their work in ministry, and my church too is um, very accepting of us. Um, but then um, I wouldn't talk for just me. I also acknowledge that there are other women in other churches who do not have that opportunity. So that some churches, some Pentecostal churches, up to today, do not ordain women as ministers because they still go by. Um, the Apostle Paul's um, admonishment in First Corinthians um, 14, 34 to 36, and also First um, Timothy 2, 9 to 14, that women are supposed to keep quiet in the church. And so the highest you can go is to become a deaconess, you know. Um, so it means that there are so many, a lot has to be done, right? So that we, so I may not have that challenge in my, my church, but I think other women even here in Ghana that I know of have that problem. And even some churches where women are allowed to be ordained, serve as leaders, you realize that even the ratio of men to women 
it's just um it's just too um, ridiculous right and it's it's um such that women are even afraid to put themselves up out there when it comes to high positions so that it's always men who are um, vying for such positions you only get a very high ranking position when you happen to be the um the wife of the general overseer or you were the one who founded the church right so that's the challenge so i will say i don't have that problem but i also want to talk for other women that they are still facing um that challenge and it's highly discouraging to us that up till now we are still we still have to struggle um for a place um at the table yeah thank you for sharing um, i know that you teach about culture yes. especially with sum and i wanted to ask you in particular how do you view culture affecting women who are leading in church ministry um i would say that a people's culture um will have um a lot of influence on the way they see um gender roles you know how they um, um perceive their gender roles uh, but i would say that i mean you know culture is our way of life and whether we like it or not the gospel has to be contextualized in any environment it finds itself so as africans we express our religion our christianity through african lens right but then when you come to ghana you realize that um in the past in the pre-colonial times and even during the colonial times um women um had <laughs> a, a lot of respect in society you realize that women a woman could do anything she wanted she could be a priestess she could be a leader she could be like a spiritual healer she could be an army commander um, a classic case in point was um, Yasan towards the queen mother of Ejisu in Ashanti who led her people in, to fight the British um, in 1900. So you realize that even at that time, they saw the woman as the repository of knowledge or, or wisdom, right? So that even when um, um, they were supposed to make very difficult decisions, they had to consult with the woman before um, they would do anything. So it came, they, it brought up this popular saying that let's go and consult with the woman, that kind of stuff. But now, with the coming of Christianity, with um, colonialism, it actually changed the dynamics of how women are viewed in our culture um, to the point that, you know, the, the, um, the creation story about how God created Adam first before he. Um, and also Paul's admonition that we mentioned it's giving men some kind of impetus to think that um, they, they were created first, they were the first born and so they had to. So I think culturally our culture is pro-women but then the Christian dynamic has changed it, right? And one problem I have is that we have copied it hook, line and sinker. We haven't really thought through it and seen, like, we haven't gone back to um, we don't look at Christianity and how we treat women through the African lens. We rather, we rather look at it through the Eurocentric way of looking at things. So that's the problem um, that we have now. So now the tables have turned. Instead of African view women as um, a truly the co-worker in, in, in the Lord's work, we rather, we rather see women as being um, inferior to men and it's very worrying yeah so i hope that answers your question <laughs> yes that is fascinating so the uh the way and even politically are there many yes. women in political office in ghana it's ref so that's actually um whatever is happening in the church is a reflection of what happens in the uh, political arena so that you see that there are fewer women in political positions especially high ones you can be whoever you think you are just cross it out of your um bucket list that you become a president in ghana anytime soon right if you were a woman but then so you realize that and when women have maybe about 20 percent 25 percent in parliament we think we've done well right that's the problem 
So whatever is happening in the church is more like a microcosm, it's a reflection of what is happening politically and it has to change. Yeah, because the church is some kind of um, the power broker. Whatever we do is informed by the church, by Christianity. So if Christians, we are exhibiting that, then we are also telling the politicians that it's good to keep women at bay, you know, just give them just a few positions just to keep them happy. But then I think we have to um, change things up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, that's, that is really uh, thought provoking mm -hmm. to think about how Western, Western's view of Christianity has shaped the yeah. African church specifically and Ghana specifically even more. So um, in that context, wow. So our interpretation of those scriptures, because I don't uh, necessarily believe that, um, the interpretation of you know the with the hierarchy and um the man being domineering um and i don't believe that that is uh contextualized that is yeah. a western lens a western interpretation exactly. um so i did not realize <laughs> that uh the how far that influence went oh it's so far reaching you know and most of the time people um view what is happening in africa from outside and they think most of the things we see are just a reflection of the colonial um and christian influence right and it's a bit worrying as an african scholar to think that we have still not broken away from those ways of thinking. If anything, we have to go back to our roots, not that we should go for everything, but then the, the values that are, would be good, to, that will serve us well in the modern era. It's better to go back to them, especially um, the important, um, you know, the significance of the African women in the past. I think we have to go back to it. And, um, yeah, women make the world go around and, Without us, the world would not be any better place to live. So. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so let me ask you another question. Okay. What would you, what advice would you give to women who are trying to overcome these challenges? How would you uh, encourage them to? work through these issues, culture, um, church culture, mm -hmm. scriptural interpretation, what, what advice, what um, encouragement? I, I believe that, you know, most of the time, the way women go about our, our struggle for recognition is wrong. Um, you know, when you want something, I will say that I understand the insecurities and everything that comes with um, working in this um, male-dominated field of ministry, right? But then it also does not mean that it's a competition, right? Um, it's more like, as you said um, at the beginning, we are not fight. it's not a fight. We are not um, fighting for anything. It's just for equality, right? So we have to view um, this struggle as um, whatever work we are doing for God is it's supposed to be a complementary role and not a competitive one, right? So the moment you look at it from that angle, it makes you step back and you want to regroup and come back with a better strategy. So instead of working to undermine men, and that is why sometimes I have a problem. I, I don't want to call myself a feminist because most of the time people think um, we they are aggressive, you know, <laughs> the way... We, we go about things as races, but then we want to make sure that everything is about Christ. At the end of the day, it's about Christ and not about our ego, right? So when we understand it that way, we know that whatever, whether I'm being recognized or I'm not being recognized, I'm working as if unto the Lord, right? As unto the Lord. And the moment we take out the ego and the, the need to be seen and to head with that forceful way, of going about things. It's, it just muddies the waters for us. When we are rude 
we are insubordinate, we don't want to listen to anything, we, we just, we just uh, make things worse. At the end of the day, we are trying to reconcile the world back to Christ, and that, is, that should be our main focus. Just talk to, use, um, let me say, dignified dialogue in talking to our male counterparts, just to make sure um, they understand our position and the need to bring women um, to the table. At the end of the day, um, it's all about him. I don't think it's about me at all. So that is it. Very good. All right, we have someone else joining us. Um, oh. <laughs> catching them up on some of the questions. We're just basically having a conversation with Dr. Comfort Maxworth from her perspective. Um, and she has shared some really thought provoking things about culture, especially in Africa, in our Western perspective and the influence that we've had uh, it, through Christianity and colonialism, um, which is really fascinating to me. But um, I'm going to ask you also, how might theology, and especially that of Pentecostalism, um, inform the practice of women leading in church? Um, I, I, I just think that, you know, theology is basically um, um, this, the careful study about God, right? Um, but I realized that most of the view about women has already been skewed, right? Um, um, and so I think what theology has to do to help us is to um, just help us to reinterpret some of the scriptures that are, are supposedly anti-women, which, which are also keeping women at bay, preventing a lot of churches from um, um, ordaining women or allowing women to also serve in the church. So theology has a lot to do. Um, it has to um, it has to teach us that we were all created in the image and the likeness of God. And so the woman is not inferior to the man, neither is the man inferior to the woman. We are all supposed to be equal part partners in, um, in ministry. And that is why um, Adam, um, Eve was taken out of the side of, um, what, of Adam and not his back or something, you know. And even when Adam saw Eve, he said, this is of course, truly um, the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh, telling us that um, he considered um, Eve to be um, in equal standing with him. And also theology will have to point us to the fact that when Jesus was alive during his ministry, he challenged um, most of the gender prejudices that were happening during his time. And it even um, also points to the fact that Jesus directed most of his ministry to women, especially when you read um, the Gospel of Luke. And we also know that women played an important role in Jesus' ministry. They basically supported him. So um, what theology has to do is to unearth all these truths, correct some of these misconceptions about the place of women um, in Christianity. And as Pentecostals, I think we have to lead the way you know, and you were, we were talking about what happened in the upper room during the day of Pentecost. That is what Pentecost is about. That is what being a Pentecostal is about. God has poured out his spirit on all flesh, irrespective of their race, their, um, their color, their gender. So we all have to move together and, do, um, and raise the banner of Jesus higher. So I think theology can shape uh, the way we see women and as Pentecostals we need to live. That's so good. Um, for those who have just joined us, or for those of you who are here, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. And I will oh. ask it in a, um, we'll review it in a few minutes. So um, let's see here, another question I have. What practical advice? Well, you, you've given a lot of practical advice. Yeah, I, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've covered some of my questions already that I had prepared. What are some resources that you might be able to share specifically for women of color who, are, who feel called to ministry? Um, thank you very much. I think ministry is for all. And sometimes I really don't want to make it women of color, Western people, but it's also necessary that we make 
um, those um, distinctions. But what I would tell um, these women is that your first point of call is the Bible, right? Of course, it's the Bible. It's going to teach you everything that the Bible extols um, the values of women. I will tell you to specifically read um, the books of Esther and Ruth. Um, these two books actually um, show us how two foreign women, two women um, succeeded in, in foreign lands in spite of the challenges they had to, um, to endure. Um, so uh, these are good. Um, you can also read um, the Synoptic Gospels, especially um, the book of the Gospel of Luke. Um, it says a lot about how Jesus, Jesus and his relationship with women, you know, even when they wanted to stone the woman for adultery, he just stepped in. Um, he saved the woman with the issue of blood and all of that. So Jesus directed his, um, his ministry to them. But there are a few books too that I can suggest if they, are, they can look them up um, in their spare time. Um, the first one is um, How I Changed My Mind About Women in Leadership, Compelling Stories from Prominent Evangelicals. This book um, was edited by Alan Johnson, um, and the foreword was written by Dallas Willard, a, a scholar of, um, um, I think, spiritual formation. Yeah, so you read this and you realize that there were a lot of evangelicals who were um, evangelists evangelist who thought women were supposed to be the second or the third wheel or something, but in their work with God, they came to appreciate that women were supposed to be co-partners or equal partners in ministry. You can also um, look for emboldening. Um, it's um, a vision for empowering women in ministry. It was authored by Tara Beth Leach. That's also a good resource. And um, um, you can also look at Why Not Women, a biblical study of women in missions, ministry and leadership. And it was um, authored by Lauren Cunningham, David Hamilton, and Janice um, Rogers. So you can read these books and you will feel empowered and you realize that whether you are white, you are black, you are blue, you are whoever, um, you are a woman, you are a man, you are a child, um, you still have a place um, um, in, in God's ministry. As long as the call is upon your life, then it means God has a mission for you that you need to accomplish. So these are some of the key resources that I can think of at the moment. Excellent. I love those books. I have not been able to read Emboldened yet by Tara Beth. Oh, okay. I, yeah, really I would good. like to. It's on my wish list. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what suggestions would you give to those who want to change the dynamics of their churches or ministry or their leadership to become mixed gender mm -hmm. and truly embrace uh, ethnicity, cross cultural ministries, um, you know, being diverse racially as much as possible? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would say, as I think it, it will go back to what I said earlier. We need to be patient. We need to, and also exhibit a level of um, grace, right, in our approach. We have to be gracious in our approach um, in such things. Um, in fighting for our right to be included, we must, we don't have to come across as being rude or disrespectful, insubordinate, and even power hungry. It's, it doesn't have to be about our ego. We are not pushing a personal agenda or a female agenda. Everything is God's agenda that we, we are approaching. So the approach that we need must be dignified um, to the point that others will, will know. You, one thing I do when I, well, I'm, I'm very not, I'm not competitive at all. I don't like competition. And when I go somewhere and I realize people are very not accepting of me because of maybe who I am or what I've, what I've become or whatever, I just, keep my hands off. I don't want to fight for any positions or anything. I just do my work as I go along. And at the end of the day, you realize that everything will come full circle. And they'll realize that, oh, man, this lady had something to offer. So let's give her the chance. So that's what I also want to suggest, um, that um, we just have to be dignified in our fight for 
um, gender equality and whether it's gender or it's racial or it's cultural equality, it has to be guided by the scripture, right? We need to be guided by the scripture. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. And while we do it, we have to keep them at the back. We have to know that everything we do has to be to the glory of God. It doesn't have to be about us at all. So that's what I can say. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's, that's wonderful. Yes. I've got to get my handkerchief out. <laughs> what I preach in. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, I think that, that I've covered just about all of my questions. Okay. Did I ask you about the scriptures that have guided you in your journey? No, you haven't. Okay. Uh, would you want me to talk a little bit about them? Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, the scriptures that have guided me in my journey, um, I love the Bible. I love everything in the Bible, but as, as a human, as a woman, I also have my, my very favorite scriptures, um, that my go-to scriptures, um, so to speak. And the first thing that I like is Genesis 127. It just says that, we're all created in the image and likeness of God, right? So being a woman, it does not uh, make me any less um, than the man. So since I'm created in the image of God and his likeness, it means I'm equally um, also called to, to be in ministry. Then you realize, you, you mentioned one of them, when you were talking um, in the beginning, I said, oh, this lady is, I think it's a confirmation that in the last day, God said he would pour out the Spirit on all people, Acts 2, 17 to 18, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. This, um, this passage actually was lifted directly from Joel um, 2, 28 to 29. So you see, it was quoted in the Old Testament and it's been confirmed in the New Testament that, you know what, God has poured out his spirit and God also, and it also confirms what it says in Acts 10, 34, that God is no respecter of persons. So if God is no respecter of persons, then it tells me that whether you are a man or a woman, you are still qualified to, to serve in, um, in God's vineyard. And the thing is that God has not given us the spirit of fear, as he said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. So we have to go, go about our work of ministry with boldness, with love, and with sound mind, knowing that God is with us, right? And at the end of the day, he knows the plans that he has for us, as he said in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. So if God has good plans, if God's thoughts for you are good, to give you hope and unexpected end. Then it means, irrespective of the challenges that you face um, in ministry, God will always come to you and His purpose for your life will always be um, fulfilled. Yeah. So these are the few scriptures that I hold so dear to my heart and they guide me on my journey. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So are there any other questions? Um, would anyone like to either share? Uh... I saw one from your husband um, just now. Um, yeah, I think he wants to know um, what I think about the influence or effects of Pentecostalism in Ghana or Africa. Um, I will say, I, as an African, I will say that uh, the Pentecostal um, tradition, it's become um, the biggest phenomenon, right? In, as far as Christianity in Africa um, is concerned. But then most of what Pentecostals do is not too different from what used to pertain um, in African traditional religion, right? The whole idea of the spirit, we, Africans also have their concept of um, the spirit. So God is there, but he's also supported by deities and 
um, small gods and stuff like that. I would say that um, Pentecostalism has brought some kind of boldness, right? Um, with how when the Christian, um, the missionary Christians came, they couldn't do quite much, right? Because they were out of touch with the real the realities of the African, right? So, um, and what I said, the existence of spirits and evil spirits and witchcraft and all of these things. They, they just rubbish them. They thought they were just superstitious. They thought African traditional religion was superstitious. They, they did not really pay much attention to them. And also, um, because of that, it, they were just too out of touch. The people just did not connect with their kind of Christianity until Pentecostalism came along. And the people were like, oh man, this is just like uh, our, our own, but just that it's of a higher value. So now Africans are, especially African Christians, what I don't like about um, our attitude is what I was telling you earlier that we are allowing these Western principles to just um, affect or shape the way we view the world. But then I think Pentecostalism has been a positive, um, a, a positive, um, let me say, tool or weapon to mobilize people just bring them together, give them, it's more like an empowering tool, right? Although now it's also become a curse <laughs> in Africa because now, um, so it's a two-edged sword. Um, it's empowering people, all the Pentecostal ethics um, propounded by Veda and all of that, but also that um, swindling aspect of it whereby some people are taking advantage of people in the name of the spirit, in the name of God. That is also, so it's both positive and negative. We just have to find a way to maneuver and like renegotiate and make sure that we come back to the core principles of our Pentecostal. So it's had both positive and negative effects. We are still dealing with them um, here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I've heard you share about politics and yeah. Christianity. It also influences our politics, yeah, and that's I don't know why I didn't mention that. Yeah, because that's been my research. Um, so Pentecostalism it has it become the mainstay um, in Ghana, and uh, like you cannot be a politician if you don't exhibit a little bit of. Or no, you cannot be a successful politician if you you don't <laughs> exhibit a little bit of Pentecostalism, whether you agree with them or not. You need that constituency. So you realize that. Politicians play to Pentecostals a lot. So they shape our politics. Actually, they shape almost every aspect of the Ghanaian life and Ghanaian culture. And so that is good, but at the same time, it's getting a bad rap for some of the bad nuts who have started to, like, you know, do people all in the name of the Holy Spirit, right? And prophecies and deliverance and, and all of that. Wow, there's a lot I could say there, but I, I just appreciate hearing that perspective. Um, I'd like to ask for you to uh, just pray over the people, this people who are listening, and um, those who are in our class are in our webinar right now. Sorry, forgive me for using the word class. I'm just so used to. Um, <laughs> saying that in. oh uh there is one more yeah question. brian wants to know reverend fulton wants to know um so he wants to know that so in effect there's a transforming of worldviews going on yeah so um it's transformed uh um whose worldview are we transforming is it debbie's or mine or you <laughs> Uh, I want to get, okay, yes, okay, so, so all of us, our worldviews have been um, transformed, but the thing is that, um, as I said, the African worldview is now um, shaped by um, Christian, that's even our, our politics, you know, our constitution, um, just like the U.S., it's still in um, Christianity, 
Um, but now you realize that politicians, um, Pentecostals are now swinging the vote. So if you want to, um, so as, as a Pentecostal, even now the mainline churches are forced to behave as Pentecostals. That's where the problem is because they are losing um, members. They are losing their younger generation and they want to make sure they keep them. So if you can't win them, you join them. So now you have to introduce a whole lot of Pentecostal ways of drumming, dancing, singing, and whatever, just to keep people. So the transformation, but then, as I said, the transformation has to be holistic, right? Whereby I think now for some of us, you, I was having a conversation with my mom um, earlier today that the problem I have with Ghanaian Pentecostals is that where we need to work, we pray. <laughs> instead of working we pray right and there are so many things that god will not come from heaven because he's given us the wisdom to to do them so i think we need our views are shaped by principle but i think it should be the right doctor like what Weber was talking about that um charismatic ethic you know that work ethic that you know you have to go out there to work because if you don't work you don't eat and that is what I want us to bring back that for Pentecostals, we are go-getters. We have to go out there. Apart from winning people for Christ, we also take good care of ourselves, work and change the society. We don't only have to change our world through prayers. Prayers is good, but we also have to work hard to maintain whatever we are trying to do. And he's holding a baby, aren't you a, 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 an adorable father? <laughs> My sister is so lucky. Um, thank you. God bless you. <laughs> a teething baby. <laughs> I know. I know. You are such an adorable father. God bless you. Keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for your valuable time, for taking your time to do this. And I just, you know, I love to hear your perspective and learn um, just from a different perspective, you know, I, I know that we can learn from each other and we have to understand that we are all working together in this globally. This is a global effort uh, amongst our brothers and sisters in Christ that we need to join together for the sake of the gospel, to preach the gospel, to train others in how to preach the gospel and share the love of Christ and make Jesus the center. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's really important to hear from, you know, hear from our brothers and sisters across countries and in, yeah. with different perspective and different lenses, different worldviews. So we all come from the same Christian worldview, Pentecostal, most yeah. of us Pentecostal charismatic worldview, but different cultures. It's so important. And I wanted to just add a little bit to what you said earlier, that the problems women are facing in ministry is not only unique to people in the U.S. Um, it's more like we are all shedding the same tears, right? So different people shedding the same tears. So I think women will have to look out for one another. And the sad truth is that where women are restricted, the number one critics are fellow women. <laughs> That's the problem. So these women have got into this traditional way of looking at the role of women or her place in the church. And so I think instead of just working against ourselves, we should rather come together, um, present a common front and see if we can break through um, what Hillary will say, the glass ceiling. Some of some places it's iron ceiling and how do you break through them? We just need to um, unite to, to get that to happen. Yeah. yeah, one of the things that is, just coming back to my memory, I had a conversation with Dr. Beth Grant. I'm not sure if you know her, but um, she had mentioned in her travels, in her work overseas, that she sees in the places where the most restriction comes upon women, when the Holy Spirit comes and takes control and there's a true revival and the Spirit is poured out upon the people, there is this lift this not just like a you know a social lift yes but there's this lift for women uh, exactly. 
to just move in the giftings that the Holy Spirit has given them. And she finds that that's true no matter where we are at, even yeah. in those super restrictive countries. But it, you know, that the Holy Spirit would move upon us once again. That's my prayer. Yeah, that's what we need. You know, yes. wherever the Holy Spirit went, it, bro it broke barriers, you know. Look at what happened during the Azusa Street experience. It, it was so beautiful. It wasn't just racial barriers that were broken, but also gender um, and cultural barriers, you see. So um, we just have to trust him. I think we need to pray more for that move of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't see much of that now. We need to cry for it to come back. And as I said, I think whatever we do, it has to be guided. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Just allow him to take control because he alone can bring this change. We can fight all we want, but <laughs> if he doesn't step in, nothing will, will get done. So I think what she said is true. The move of the Spirit should happen so that it will just break all these. Some of the barriers, we don't even see them. They are unwritten rules, right? But they still hold us back. So we need to, um, and women should unite. I have a problem with women who, who fight against other women. You go to churches and women are the ones who keep us down. <laughs> we should stop that and just allow the spirit to go. Yeah. Amen. Well, would Amen. you mind closing us in prayer? Yes, I will. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Um, dear Lord and Father Jesus, we bless you, we honor you, we thank you so much um, for this beautiful conversation that we've had. I thank you for the life of my sister, Reverend Dr. Debbie Fulcock, and her family, her husband, for even conceiving such a brilliant idea. I pray, oh God, that you keep on enlarging their territory, their coast, you keep on blessing them, oh God and giving them with more innovative ideas that will help to expand your kingdom. I pray, oh God, that whatever be their heart desires to bring them to pass, even in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray your protection over her, over her family. I pray, oh God, that cause no harm to come near them in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless them in their ministry and every endeavor of this. I commit our viewers into your hands. Call uh, Martin, Wendy, and all the other people who are going to watch online later, that wherever they are, touch them. Let this conversation touch them. Speak to them through it. Use this to change the way they see you and they see others. Use this avenue, oh God, to bring about unity even in Christendom. I pray, oh God, committing the rest of the day, the week, the month, and the year into your hands, oh God, that be with us, help us, oh God, and most importantly, we pray for this friendship that it will never end. It will continue and also keep bearing much fruit. All to the glory. At the end of the day, everything is about you, Christ. So we know you will make it happen. We thank you. We bless you. We honor you for an answered prayer. Even in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 And thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to receive some of the, the videos last four weeks, I have a um, link to them. I can send you those who are already subscribed to the, uh, I had this landing page through MailChimp, um, just so that I can send you a link to those videos, access to them. But um, thank you. And May the Lord bless you. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me. And we also have a Facebook page. I'm just um, starting up. So it will be like a page with resources and just to continue the conversation. I don't know that I'll be super active on it as I'd like to because of our upcoming trimester with SUM. It's going to be very busy. <laughs> but I would love to be able to share resources and um, continue this conversation. So thank you all for coming. May the Lord bless you.